The ocean and its seven seas. It covers about 71% of our planet's surface. It was here before any form of life began to emerge and will remain here for millions of years in the future. During its exceptionally long lifespan, it's seen a gargantuan amount of change. It's seen the rise of Pangaea and watched its supercontinent broke into various modern day continents. It may have even been the reason for the creation of new continents. But how does this mighty system work? It is not only controlled by the forces within, but it's also controlled by the forces of the atmosphere. First up is insulation. This, in simple terms, is the amount that a given area receives of the sun's solar radiation. Logically, we all know that the areas on the equator are hotter than more often than any other area, and are also obviously receive the highest temperatures. These areas also receive more insulation than any, almost any other area in the world. There are a very wide range of waves. Going in size order, these include capillary waves, chop waves, swirl waves, tsunami waves, and up to a storm surge. Capillary waves are the calmest stage of the sea. Wind can very often be seen flowing very gently over the water. Next comes chop waves. This is arguably the most common size of waves seen in certain areas around the world. It is often distinguished by the bumpy sea with smaller waves breaking very lightly and quickly on it. After that comes the swell. These are waves that are created by winds from far away storm winds. These are much larger than chops and can range from surfable waves to ones that are larger to capsize boats. Then it comes to the iconic tsunami. While there are a very wide range of opinions on what a tsunami is, the true definition is a very large wave from the ocean that is almost always caused by an earthquake. This earthquake can change in power depending on size and where the earthquake is in the world. Finally, there are storm surges. This is a rising of the ocean above its normal level caused by pressurized atmospheric pressures such as storms. Tides are no matter entirely. Higher or lower than average, there are two different types of tides, neap and spring. Spring tides occur when the three celestial bodies of the Earth, Moon and Sun are all in alignment. The gravitational force must also be very strong for these tides to occur twice a month. In more specific regards, spring tides are abnormally high. Neap tides, on the other hand, occur when the Earth is on a right angle from the Sun. Meanwhile, the Moon and the Sun are working against each other. Neap tides can be identified as they happen during the first and last quarters of a Moon. The Coriolanus force was first described by a French astronomer called Gustave Gustave Coriolanus, who we will learn more about later. Back in 1835, he described a force that was created due to a circular motion. The simplest way of describing the force is using an example. Imagine if there was a gunner with a cannon that was standing in Kenya on the equator, and they fired a cannonball directly at the North Pole. You would assume that the cannonball would end up directly hitting the North Pole, but instead the cannonball begins to venture eastward. This is due to the Earth's rotation at the equator, which is 1,600 kilometers an hour, it's like a 2013. As it moves, the cannonball continues its eastern pattern so that when it finally arrives at the original desired target, it will instead land more towards Siberia. In the northern hemisphere, independent objects from the Earth's surface will go towards the right, whereas those same objects will be towards the left in, in the southern hemisphere. The Earth is very far from flat. There are thousands of different depths reached by different areas of our world, and when discussing tides, these areas must be included. Example is best here. In the North Sea, water often builds up and is eventually brought down by gravity. The water that has been pulled down is then affected by the Coriolanus force and is pushed away. This keeps happening until there's a system working around this, with water consistently being deflected. This is named an amphipodomic system and basically has no tidal variation. As you move further away from the system, new tides begin to form under the name co-tides. Of the two theories we will be discussing, this one requires most assumptions. The Earth is, unfortunately, for the sake of simplicity, not spherical, and there are seven continents in the way of the oceans. This theory says that, there are, that the two little bodies around the planet are responsible for the tides. For example, when the Sun and Moon are aligned, the tidal force exerted by the Moon is backed up by the tidal force created by the Sun. This is a spring tide. Ratchelin, 2013. On the other hand, when the two lunar bodies are at a right angle to each other, the tidal force created won't be the same, but won't be too far off themselves. This is a neat tide. Now we will be discussing a lot of different factors that affect surface currents. Obviously there is quite a bit to go through, so let's not waste any more time. Also there is atmospheric circulation. These are wind circulation cells that the sun keeps generated due to its solar heat inputs. Earth has three major atmospheric shells, the Hadley shell, the polar cells, and the feral cells. Each atmosphere has one of the three. 
The polar cells are, as you expect, found under north and south poles. They are both the furthest north and the furthest south cells. The second cells are the feral cells. Named after the man who identified them, William Ferrell, these cells can be located in America and Europe on the Northern Hemisphere and around the lowest areas of Argentina and Oceania in the Southern Hemisphere. Finally, there are Hadley cells. Like the feral cells, this group was named after their identifier, George Hadley. These cells can be located on the equator and are the only cells to be connected as a pair. On the ground, around all three of these cells, semi-permeate wind systems are built up. The, area, the air is then moved into areas that are warmer, causing this air to rise. This semi-permeate air can go on to cause. As previously stated, surface current formation is any method that forces a current to be created in the water. This can include anything from the previously mentioned semi-permeate air to gravity and even large events like earthquakes. Focusing on the wind path, the direction that a surface current is flowing will not be the same as the ocean current that will be heading. This is due to current earth deflection, which will be covered later. The surface current formations can lead to the formation of Gyres, in relatively simple terms, are constantly rotating systems of currents that can be located across the Earth. There are five major ocean gyres in the world, the North Atlantic, North Pacific, Indian Ocean, South Atlantic and South Pacific. Gaspard Gustave Cote de Coriolis was a French scientist with a strong interest in the ocean and how it operated. One of the main things he identified was the method of deflection that he named after himself. He realised due to the deflection, currents inside the gyres would move more right in the Northern Hemisphere and left while in the Southern Hemisphere. He also discovered that when currents move around particular areas of the ocean, they began to form a clockwise rotation. Some of these operate at relatively normal speed, but some are sped up by processes that he discovered, calling on his false influence on surface currents, which he, again, named after himself. He worked out that as currents move, his new name of force deflects the currents back to the right, they then proceed to pile up the middle of the guy that they are circling. On the hill of the newly created gyre, there is a higher level of pressure than on the edges of the gyre. This is called the pressure gradient force. When this happens, the flowing water will begin to move towards the edges up from the centre. The water is supported by gravity as the edges are downwards. Coriolis force is present during this process and affects it by deflecting the water so that it's moving towards the right. The current that is created by this flowing water is known as as previously mentioned, geostrophic flow is the flowing water current formed by pressure gradient force. However, it is also aided by wind-driven circulation. This extra-created current gives the geostrophic flow a new momentum so, so that the very last drops in speed will not bring the entire system to a complete stop. Water is not attached to the Earth's tectonic plates like land masses are. Like us and other forms of life, the only thing keeping water on the planet is gravity. Obviously the Earth is constantly spinning and the gravity pulls the water with it. However, there is a large lag with the water being dragged by gravity which leads to areas of high levels of buildup and causes some areas of currents to be broader than others, for example, the Canary Current. This is the intensification of western boundary currents. What this means is some areas of particular currents are going to be much deeper than others. For example, the Canary Current has western intensification performed on it for thousands of years. So the side facing the Canaries themselves is much shallower than the side facing the continent of Africa. There are a very wide number of currents displaying this intensification, like the EAC in the South Pacific and the Brazil current in the South Atlantic, Townsend 2012. When it comes to oceanography, V. Wilfred Ekman was a very smart cookie. He took the work of one Gaspard Gustavi de Colionis, who we have previously talked about, and adapted it to fit his lifelong research of oceanography. He applied the work already done by Coriolis and learned there was much more to be applied. Logically speaking, if there is a layer of water on the surface of the ocean and is being pushed by the air currents above the surface, then shouldn't the next level down be affected as well? Obviously the water a few levels down won't have the air pushing it, it would only have the gravity of the layer above it. Therefore it will be a few degrees slower than the above layer. The cycle will then continue continue deeper into the water until a spiral has been created, appropriately named an excellent spiral. But this spiral can't last forever. The spiral will eventually die down and leave behind excellent transports. This is left over constantly moving water from a 90 degree angle. 
but we aren't quite done with X-Men yet. The remaining X-Men transport can be either adapted in two different forces. Upwelling is when X-Men transport is picked up by a new wave current. The transport will be brought towards the surface while also acquiring many different types of nutrient-filled water and brings it down to the surface to cause biological activity. Downwelling is when a different wind current picks up the element transport and runs it along the coast of a landmass. The water soon stops up and sinks, obviously leading it to be less productive than upwelling. The final principle to be discussed is the thermohaline circulation. This is how seawater moves depending on the variables of its location, which can lead to changes of both density and seawater. The majority of it will continue moving across the planet like it has for countless years, occasionally upwelling or downwelling. However, some of the seawater are forced towards certain areas and will continue towards these sections, including the very large conveyor belt that continues to circle all seven seas. Thank you so much for listening to this talk and I hope it helps you in some way.